Mark chapter, Mark chapter 13. Get all the buttons put. Yes, they were crowded. They all, but the airport was empty. So figure that out. American. That's the only one to fly. Mark 13, if you will. Uh, we're, we're down into verse 30 and 31 and following. So we'll start reading here at verse 28 and um, move on down. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. And, and again, last time uh, we saw that issue there. Of, of If you can look around the world about you and know what season it is, it's not the springtime, it's the summertime, it's not winter, it's summer, then you can look around, you can tell what's going on, verse 29, so ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. And again, this passage gets used, verse 30, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And they use this uh, passage to try to date the rapture, to try to date the second coming. And uh, they, the anti-dispensational folks the preterists, the, the Calvinists, the reformers, and all of that, they, again, they, like, they, they use the budding of the fig tree. And uh, they say, they misidentify what the fig tree is re referencing to in the scriptures, and that is the issue of the religious life. They say, no, it's the national life. So then they go to 1948, and they add 40, and take away 7, and get 31, and that... Now we're 1988, nope, 81, and then we have an argument about the generations because verse 30, verily I say unto you that this generation, so now they've got a generational argument of, well, it's 100 years or 40, see, 100 years, they have to say that because the dating isn't matching up because the rapture didn't happen. So the, the point in all that is, <laughs> the point in the passage is, is when you see all these events around you, know that the second coming is nigh. It's close. Now, if you come over to Luke 21, just in trying to remind ourselves of where we're at here, Luke 21 and verse 25, uh, the parallel passage here, uh, verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stresses of na nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And here's where we're at in Mark 13. When you see all this stuff up, now let's look up. Now, the interesting thing here is when he says, then look up and lift up your heads. If you come over to Acts chapter 1, there's something very specific here that's going to happen. In, in Acts chapter number 1, you start there in verse 9. Now, the, the resurrection of the Lord has happened. He spent 40 days with them. Verse 9, and when he had spoken these things, when they, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go in to heaven. Now think about that. In Luke 21, 28, when you see all that cosmic, then look up. Here the angels look at them and say, what are you doing looking up? It's time to go to work. It's time to get back into town. Don't stand here looking up. See, Just, again, he's, he, he's taken up personally. He's gone. Now, he, now it's time. It's you guys are looking up. It's not time for his return. It's time for you to go to work. you got work to do. Now go. That's why in, in Acts 1 here in verse 6, they ask that question, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to, to Israel? 
And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. See that? But what, but what are they? They understand that when they see the cosmic, that's what Mark 13 is doing. <laughs> now you go look up. Right now it's not time. It's not, ti it, it, it's not time to be looking up. It's time to get on with the work. And that's really, so when you come back to Mark 13, what Mark 13 is. It's time to go to work. Here's what the servants are going to do. And when you see all that ju those judgment events take place, and come up against you, then it's time to look up. Now, in verse 30, he says there, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. I think last time we, we talked briefly about the generation thing. They will say, a generation, it's not always time. Actually, it's very rarely time unless the context says so. And again, they'll say 100 years, they'll say 33 years. By the way, 33 is the perfect generation time-wise that matches the Lord. Some will say 40, but then you got you know, you, you, you got all of that. That's really not what he's talking about here. Uh, come back with me to Matthew. He's really talking about generate. These are the ones who live in the line of... Where did it come from is what is really the issue. Uh, look at Matthew 3. It's really the issue in the scriptures, not how long did it last. The issue of generation is where did it come from? Where did it start? What's the lineage, the line? Uh, if you look at Matthew 3, verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You see, the, who's the viper? The adversary, Satan is. That, that, so they're really of who? Generation. They're being generated. And John, he calls them, you're of your father, the devil. We come over to chapter 23. So when you think about generation, what all of the prophecy guys say is that's the people in the moment. But in the scriptures, it isn't the people in the moment. It, well, it's more than just the people in the moment. It's this lineage, this line. Where did all this wicked generation starts in Genesis 4 with Cain? And it's, it's not a ta time element. It's who are, who are they following? Who's, who's in this long line? Matthew 23, if you look there at verse 29... In Matthew 23, you have the woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So if anyone ever tells you that the Lord Jesus Christ wanted you, was meek and mild and, 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 and lowly with the people, just bring them to Matthew 23. By the way, if you look at verse 1, then spake Jesus to his disciples and to, his, uh, uh, to the multitude and to his disciples, Verse 13, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he just peels, the, peels them back. And so he, it's not always where the Lord is, is uh, meek and mild. He's much more. But if you look at verse 29, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the scriptures of the righteous and say, I'm sorry, the sepulchres of the righteousness, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. So who are they? Here's who you are. Here's who you belong to. You're the children, the generation, the generate, the next in the line. Fill up, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generations of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? That doesn't sound like turn the other cheek and all flowery and wimpy stuff. He's what's he? Here's where they come from. They're gener being generated by the viper, by the the system. 
Verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. What are they doing? They're killing them. They're scourging them. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel, Genesis 4, under the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechiah, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. And that's in 2 Chronicles 24. So notice what these guys are doing. Ye, the Pharisees, the scribes, are of the, that generation. They're of the family who killed Abel, the beginning to the end of the Old Testament. Now Matthew is that transition book out of that old and into the new. And what do we have going on here? You, 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 the first Pharisee in Scripture was Cain. He brought of his own activity, his own works. He denied what the Word of God said, and he came in his own religion, in his own self-interest. And, the, and that the, the, they're going to last here till the second coming, because in the second coming, what's he going to do? He's going to destroy them. He's going to purge out the rebel, out the apostate, leave only the believers. So come back to Acts 2. So in, in Mark 13, the, the, the use of the generation there, Acts 2, is the use not of time and people in place, but rather they're in that long line of, of those who kill the prophets. Also, just by the way, they kill John the Baptist, who is a prophet. He comes in the power of Elijah. He came from the Lord Jesus Christ. They behead him. Then they come over here and they kill uh, James, the apostle, try to shut down the word of God. They're trying to kill Peter. Now, by the way, I know John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod, but who put him up there? <laughs> The Pharisees and scribes didn't stop him. They let it happen. Acts chapter 2, you have Peter preaching. And he's just told them that by wicked hands, you guys have crucified the, the save, and slain the Savior, the Messiah. Verse 37. Again, he's talking to the nation of Israel. He's just gone down. You killed him. God raised him up. Then he sent a witness to tell you, you messed up. So, verse 27, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do? That's what they say. All right, you got us. What, what does he say? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, change your mind about who Christ is. He's a Messiah. And confess him as Messiah. Get in there and do that. And be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's be baptized. Let's get you into that little flock. Let's get you over there. Now drop down to verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Notice that. You need to untoward. So if I'm going toward something... Untoward means I'm going the other direction. If I'm to go to that do door back there, I'm going that way. Untoward is turn around and go the other way. You need to get out of, you need to get going in a different direction than that apostate generation. You need to get out of that apostate generation because that's the nation that the wrath of God's going to come on when He's going to purge them out. So this is about the 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 identification of the apostate nation and the believing remnant. That's what judgment in Scripture is really ultimately about. And what's he going to do? At his coming, he's going to destroy that apostate, that generation of viper. It's going to come to an end. So the generation of vipers, it starts with Cain, and it culminates in the Antichrist. And he's going to wipe it out. So when we come back to Mark 13... I couldn't remember if we talked about that briefly or not, but don't always get tripped up in generation and in time. When Moses 
sends the spies in and they come out and they say, now this generation can't go forward. That's time, but it's also people, but it's also unbelieving people within the nation. Because the ten uh, spies said no. <laughs> the two said yes. So there's a believing remnant that believed and said, yes, let's go in. That's all the people. But then he says, this group, no, you're not going in, so we got to get them to die off. Now, naturally, the believer of old age would die off in that time. But So it's generation of more than just time and energy and so forth. So, back to Mark 13. Now, it, <laughs> if you look at verse 30, Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Notice, it's going to take, it doesn't say, notice it doesn't say they're going to be lost. It doesn't say any of that. It doesn't say they're going to last. It, ju it says, when the Lord comes back, the, when He comes back in power and great glory, it's going to, He's going to destroy the adversary, He's going to destroy the system. Now watch verse 31, okay? Because here's the certainty of it. Now, verse 31 is a great verse that people use with the Bible issue and everything, and that's great. But in the context, heaven and earth shall, pa shall pass away, but my word words shall not pass away. So notice very carefully a couple things happening here as we look at this verse. Because here's the certainty of it. And the idea is, is if you can get rid of heaven and earth, then it's, it's the idea, it's easier to get rid of heaven and earth than to get rid of my words. Okay? Heaven and earth can pass away, but my words should, will never pass away. If you hold back, hold on, uh, come back here to Matthew 24. Notice how he says it here in Matthew 24. So the, the, here's the certainty. You know what the certainty of the judgment is? Do you know how certain the, the, the certainty of the judgment is based on the integrity of the word he's saying to them? You know how you, you can, you, you know, you, you know uh, your word's your bond and you can take it to the bank. Well, <laughs> that's what the Lord's saying. You can sit here and look at heaven and earth. It, it may pass away, and, and it does along the way, okay? But it isn't because my word is on it. Look at Mark 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There's a contrast here, if you will. There's an idea that if you, if you could get rid of heaven and earth, you could get rid of what I say. In order to get rid of the words, of my words, what do you got to get rid of? Heaven and earth. And there, there's an issue here. Uh, if you come back again, when you think about heaven and earth passing away, come back with me to over with me to Second Peter. Second Peter three. The present form of heaven and earth will pass away. Look at Second Peter three, look at verse ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned. Seeing then that all those things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all our holy conversation and godliness? Verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So there is, Peter does say, these, these elements are going to pass away, but yet not the issue of a heaven and an earth, and that's because the system of heaven and earth will never go away. It'll be repurposed. And again, it, it, it was, come back with me to Jeremiah 31. Let's work this out a little bit here. 
because there's more here than just Jeremiah 31, than just a pacifying verse to, to use in the issue of arguing the Bible thing. And you can. It's a great verse. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never. And it's right. They'll never, the words will never go away. But there's something more going on in the context. Jeremiah 31, you've got 31 to verse 34. The new covenant issues are given. Look at verse 35. Okay? So in 31 to 34, he gives the new covenant. Now he's going to... He's going to talk about the second coming. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. The one who created is the one who divided it up. But he does it for a purpose. And again, Proverbs 3, 19 and 20, by wisdom he founded and he created. Now watch verse 36. So, so you've got these ordinances in place, the creation. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me for how long? Forever. If... The way that he had ordained it all to work, the ordinan ordinances, if those things ceased and went away, then who would go away? Israel. Okay? So if you want to get rid of Israel, which, by the way, the adversary does. I mean, you think about Iraq, Iran, all those guys over there, Syria, they'd love to get rid of The United Nations would love to get rid of Israel. The adversary, the whole of it. If you could get rid of Israel, then you need to get rid of creation. And that's what it will take to get rid of Israel, no matter what. But what do we know? You're never going to get rid of the nation of Israel, and you're never going to get rid of creation. Why? Because they're put together in the creation because of the purpose of creation. Chapter 33. Let's just work this down here. Chapter 33, and look at verse 19. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their seasons. Notice, the covenant. Take those ordinances that I, the covenant, when I put them out there, uh, chapter 31 uh, calls them ordinance. Here he's calling it a covenant. Here's God's word. H heaven and earth will pass, but you can't get rid of heaven and earth because if you get rid of heaven and earth, you got to get you can then get rid of God's word, but you can't get rid of it because God's word says it ain't going anywhere. Okay? Verse 20. You take those ordinances the way I have the, the covenant. If you can break my covenant of the day, here's how I fix the day to work. Here's how I fix the night to work. If you could take all that, if you could take the way I cause them all to work, if you could take creation and cause it to not work the way I created it to work, then, verse 21, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, and as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. Man, if you could get rid of all that, then you got, you're going to get rid of David. But who is David? David is king of Israel and that seed line. Now watch verse 23, the response to this. Because there's going to be some people here who are going to respond. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Consider thou not what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord hath chosen, he hath even cast them off, 
Thus they have despised, uh, despised my people, that they should be no more a nation before them. There's going to be some people who don't like what God's saying here. In other words, what God's saying is, do, do your darndest against Israel. You're not getting rid of her. Why? Because I have a covenant with creation, and Israel is a component on creation, because I said Israel over creation. I said man over creation. Man fell, became the seed of the woman. That becomes the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And I went to David and made an oath with David that the seed of his loins were going to sit on there on the throne. So we're all connected here. And what's holding it together is his word. Two families. Make them what? No more a nation. You know what they'll say, verse 24? Just make, just get rid of Israel. Just get rid of her. No more families. They're going to say that. By the way, Psalms 83 identifies who says that. <laughs> Okay, who want to make Israel not a nation, those ten confederates, nations and everything, and so forth. Verse 25, thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy upon them. The only way to get rid of Israel and the covenant with them, who he gave to oversee the earth, is to get rid of the earth. And guess what? That's not going to happen. Come back to Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. Very fascinating thing here about creation. Genesis 9, the first time that God says that he is going to make a covenant is here with Noah. The first, after the flood, he sends Noah into the earth, and for the very first time, not, uh, chapter 9, verse 8, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. The first time he ever says, I'm making a covenant in Scripture, is, is right here. Now watch what it is. Verse 10, and with every, I'm making uh, the end of verse 9, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth will, with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of my covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I'm going to establish my covenant with you and with the seed. Verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and, notice that, the earth. Well, who's in the earth? Man came from the earth, man and all that animal creation, and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set my bow, that rainbow. In Ezekiel chapter 1, that rainbow, Ezekiel's caught up to the throne room, and that rainbow is there, and he sees the glory of God as a rainbow. What does the rainbow do? It, it manifests all the colors of light as light comes through that, and it's around that, rain, that coat of many colors. And the, the rainbow is demonstrating his glory. Adam and Eve, they were dressed with Hit with light, the verse says, he, he, there and there's like and likenesses, image, and what did they have? They had on a rainbow. They had on a coat, the original coat of many colors. And he says, here's my covenant, but what I want you to catch is with the earth and the earth, a token of it. God is making the covenant here with the earth, that the earth will be a 
stable platform from here on out for the accomplishment of his purpose, of his plan, never to be destroyed again. The earth here will never be destroyed. That's why when you go back over there in the Peter and stuff, and they'll say, oh, it's just everything's going on like normal. No, it isn't. You hold on. Look at that. Look at 2 Peter 3. Hold on to Genesis. We didn't read this when we were here. 2 Peter 3. <clears throat> And he says there in verse 4, and saying, Where is the promise of his kingdom? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now... They skipped the flood. They said they just went back to Genesis 1.1, and they said it's been going on the same. And Peter, No, it hasn't. There's been judgment in there, a picture of what's coming, and so on. So go back to Genesis 9 because of the time. So we got verse 13, a token. So what the Lord, what God's doing here is he's making a covenant with the earth that the earth is going to be that stable platform now for the carrying out of his purpose. Verse 14, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all the flesh. And water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember, watch that, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, notice how he says everlasting covenant. That means what? It's going to last forever. And he's going to use, now come over to chapter 17. He's going to use the earth as a platform for the carrying out of his purpose and his plan. Again, what did he do? He made man of the dirt and the ground. We, then we got the seed of the woman and the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the seed of David's loins, and we got Israel. And he says, you know what? The purpose of man that I originally intended is now going to be carried out by the nation of Israel over here. And I made a covenant that that earth is going to be there forever. It's never going to go away. And my word, it ain't going away. Now watch Genesis 17. Look at verse 6. God talking to Abraham. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make a nation of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Again, Abraham, everlasting covenant. Now, the focus of God's plan on the earth is now going to focus in the nation of Israel. So the focus of God's purpose and plan in the earth has now shifted Israel. Verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now Israel, where man failed, Israel is now going to take up the baton, if you will, in that everlasting covenant where he's promised it to the earth. And it can't be stopped. Come over to Psalms. 72. Psalms 72. This is a psalm for Solomon from dad to son. David here, the verse 20, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And David is going to talk here, verse 1, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteous unto, righteousness unto the king's son. Verse 4, he shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. There's the Antichrist. So we got to look ahead here. Verse 5. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. Notice that. How long is this going to last? As long as creation is there. How long is that? Everlasting. Verse 17. 
His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed as the sun and men shall be blessed. All nations shall call him blessed. The connection there between creation and God's plan and purpose in creation, it's now been focused over in the nation of Israel. So to get rid of Israel is to get rid of my purpose in creation. And if you're going to get, and, and that means you have to get rid of the whole universe. And that is never going to happen. And how do I, what's the certainty of it? My word is given. Now come over to chapter 89. 89. Psalms 89, verse 34. Psalms 89, 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. How long is this thing going to last? It's going to go on and on and on. You can't get rid of the universe, so then guess what you can't get rid of? Israel. It just ain't going to happen. How do I know that? You got my word on it. Now come over to Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now this is going to bring us back to Mark 13. His word is settled where? In heaven. Verse 90 Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the what? The earth, and it abideth. There's the connect. Uh, Mark 13, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass. They're not going to. The connection. His word is settled in heaven. It's his word that is accomplished when he created, and God said, and here's what I plan for heaven and earth is going to happen. And it's based on the integrity of His Word. The wisdom in His Word. That's why, if you come back there to Mark 13, but on your way get Isaiah 40 and verse 8. That's why in the garden, what did, he, what did Satan say? Yea, hath God said. And again, it's the attack on the integrity of God's Word. That's what it is. So in Mark 13, 31, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Isaiah 40, verse 8 is a great verse for that. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of God shall stand forever. If you think... You can get rid of heaven and earth. You can just forget about it. Why? Because my word is, it ain't going to, it's not going to pass away. It's everlasting covenant. Because of my, my words won't pass away, then creation won't pass away. Because my words are demonstrating the purpose I have in creation. So in order for my word to be true, creation has to be there. Israel has to be there. So when you come back to Mark 13... When he says heaven and earth shall pass away, it, 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 it's it's more of a it's a more it's it's not a statement of fact. This is going to happen. It's a here's how you know what I'm talking about is going to happen, because heaven and earth can't because of my words, the certainty of it. Now, if you'll look at verse 31, but my words. Notice it's a plural, the plurality. So when you have the Word, you have the whole thing. But the whole is made up of the sum of the parts, words. And the reason it says words here is because he's talking about the details in the Word. Come, up, come back to Jeremiah 15. All right? It's not just simple, it's not simply the Word, in other words, the overall message and idea and theme, but it's the words, the, plur the details that make up the word. 
And that's very important to notice because, again, we use Mark 13 and we get all wrapped up in the Bible discussion and we forget about it. It's really, we get down in the weeds here, the details of it. Jeremiah 15, look at verse 16. Watch this. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Notice, see the, diff- see the use of both words? I took in the details of what you said, and the sum of it was my joy and rejoicing. The word is made up all of all of the words, the details. And that's critically important to catch here. Uh, come back to chapter 11 of Jeremiah. 11, verse number 3. And say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Now this is going to drag us back to Deuteronomy 4, so might as well go back to Deuteronomy 4. But notice it's the words of the details of the covenant. It's not just enough to say I pay attention to the covenant, but it's... it's I, I <laughs> It's not just the idea, the sentiment, the tone, the tenor. It's down in the details of it. That's what this is all about here. He's not saying heaven and earth can't pass away because I gave my word on it. He says, no, it's in the details. Why? Because I made man to be over the earth. They failed. Then I moved it to the seed of the woman, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, and Israel. And this, that's the details of it. What's his word? The heaven and earth is, will never pass away. See. Well, here's the details of it. Look at Deuteronomy 4. And that's why I <laughs> pay attention to every little thing here. Verse 1, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Well, how do you do that? Verse 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I commanded you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. You don't add to the detail, the word, the big. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. The word is made up of the word, so what do we do? We go in and possess that. Come over to Psalms 12. This is a fascinating chapter here. Unfortunately, I think it's highly misunderstood. Chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The word... The words are what? They're pure, and what's he going to do? Keep them, preserve them. That's why in Isaiah 30, he says, Isaiah, write this down in a book for generations to come. That write, write down what was said, God said it. It's preserved, the written record of his word. So in inspiration, where God speaks, is the very act of preservation. In, order, in other words, if all Scripture are given by the inspiration of God, then preservation is going to happen. Because what did he say? Here's my word, and I said, write it down. What are they? They're pure words. They're right words. They're the correct words, and they're preserved. All that God said about his son, son's victory in, his, in, in Mark 13 there, about him coming back and going to destroy the Antichrist and do all that, is based on the integrity of his preserved word and that's the issue here the integrity of the preserved words the details but now look if you will at the con- con- context of psalms 12 verse 1 help o lord for the godly man ceaseth for the faithful fail from among the children of men so The godly remnant is in trouble. It's among the apostates. 
Verse 2, they speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The they there, that's the, that's the apostates. They have lying lips. The Lord shall cut off all flatter, flattering lips and the tongues that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Well, we say and we, we're going to say and do whatever we want to do. There is no king over us. We're good to go. Verse 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighting of the needy, now will I rise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that pure, uh, puffeth at him. Here, that's about the second coming of the Lord. Puffeth, just a bunch of hot air, just blowing all over him. Then he says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Now think about verse 7. And I think sometimes we miss this in the, in, and again, in the effort to say that the Words are going to be preserved and keep them. Notice what the them is in the context. The them is that godly remnant. The them is also the words of the Lord. Well, who's going to have the words of the Lord in the midst of the tribulation? The little flock is. So when you read, that's why in Psalms you can read and you can say, is that David? Is that the Lord? Is that the remnant? Who is this? Well, it's yes, yes, and yes. He's talking about all of them. So when you think about his, his promise, his promise of deliverance is based on the certainty. It's based on the contrast of lying lips and the adversary and the integrity of God's word. What did the word say? The word says, I'm delivering you. The word says there's a table in the wilderness that will take care of you. The word says that when you see that in Judea, flee to the mountains. It's time to get out. And what, but what does the adversary say? Oh, no, don't. Just come on down here. We're good to go. I'm God. We're good to go. Everything's fine. And he says, no, the word has been settled in heaven. The words are settled. They're settled back there in eternity past. We're good to go. So, so when you, and if you want to say verse 7 is talking about the word of God, that's fine. I think it's talking about both the believing remnant and the words are purified seven, the word of God. Why? Because who's got the word? It's going to be that believing remnant. So when you come back to Mark 13, 31, it's about the, the, the certainty of God's word. How do we get rid of it? Well, the only way you can do that is to Come in and get rid of his word. So then what do you have? Now you have the attack on the integrity of God's word. And you have this, yea, have God said. And all, all that seems to be happening. Look, they know they can't go out there and make the sun go away and the moon go away and all that good stuff. But then what do we do? We go, get, we go remove the word of God. The very words that say all of those ordinances have to stay. Verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The judgment's coming, and it's all based on what his word has said. And you know what? You can't do anything about it. It's coming. So verse 32, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now, that's a heavy verse. We'll get more into it next time. But you know what? You know what he's basically saying is, is you can't know based on your own experience. It's that verse in 1 Corinthians where, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, and the heart of man hath never thought about what the thing, you know. You can't get there on your own. You have to get there based on his word. In a time of uncertainty, of not knowing, the believing remnant have the certainty 
of God's Word, of a book. And you know, we do too. In times when we don't have the, we are an uncertain and we're not sure we have the certainty of what? God's Word. That's why we're a people of a book. That's why we are Southwest Bible Fellowship. I wanted Bible Church, but that was too close to the radio guys at the time. Why? We're Bi- Bible is the center. Why? Well, the book changes your life. It was said, it, we possess a book, and we need to let the book possess us. See, And that's a very good statement. So here in verse, again, we're going to stop because, well, the hour's up. Because verse 32 is a loaded verse. <laughs> it's got a lot, of, a lot going on in it. And we're going to spend a couple weeks looking at it in the the rest of the chapter. But what I want you to see, though, is in verse 31, the reason verse 31 sits there isn't to prove the Bible discussion. It's rather to prove the certainty of what I just told you. The judgment is coming. Now, also, if you think about why he would say heaven and earth shall pass away, why would he say it like that? Well, what did he just describe to them? all this cosmetic, cosmic stuff happening. They're going to look up, and they're going to see the sun turn to moon, and all this, and the moon, and the stars. What are they going to think? Heaven and earth is passing away. The whole of it's gone. And yet, he says, no, it's not, because here's my words on it. And remember, the certainty of the judge. The reason that judgment's coming is to purify that nation, because there's a purpose for it in the earth. Now it's time to get going. Now it's time to look up. Now here he comes. Okay? So you get it, getting back into the flow of it. We were here last week, I know, but still. Just catch what's happening in the context of it. And again, don't not use the verse to fight the Bible issue. And don't not use Psalms 12, 6, and 7. But just be a little more familiar with the context. Okay? All right. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for the look into the Word here. We thank you for the folks that are here. And Lord, I just pray that these verses would have an impact on our thinking according as they're designed to have in the context so that we know of a surety of your Word because it's made up of the details, the words, and we can understand that and look into them and and revel in the glory that will be yours in that day. In your name we pray. Amen.